Hi, everybody. Um, we're here today to do um, a webinette on fetal alcohol spectrum disorders and ju justice involved youth across the lifespan. And my name is Deb Summick, and I'm a certified fetal alcohol spectrum disorder educator. And I have worked for 34 years in all the systems where um, youth who are um, uh, over in, um, represented in uh, multiple systems such as um, the Department of Corrections in Wisconsin, the Office of the State Public Defender, um, in the child welfare system, um, both as a treatment foster care worker and doing clinical assessment work with children and families, um, as well as in the field of international adoption. Um, I am now working as a um, hospital-based child advocacy social worker for Children's Hospital of Wisconsin. And uh, my greatest teacher is um, my 17-year-old daughter um, who uh, actually was diagnosed with an alcohol-related neurodevelopmental disorder at the age of six. So I always credit her for being my greatest teacher and my greatest inspiration and understanding that these children can actually um, be successful if they have the appropriate like support, um, which we call an external brain, um, that they have um, the appropriate uh, accommodations and the treatment interventions that they need. So I'm going to talk for about 20 minutes, 20 minutes, which is a difficult um, task for this particular topic, um, but I'm going to do my best. And then we're going to take the last um, five or 10 minutes um, at the end, and uh, I will answer any questions that people have. So I will not be checking the Q&A box uh, during the course of the um, webinar until the end. So these are our learning objectives for today, and I'm not going to take the time to read them over because we'll go through them one by one, but um, I will just start into them. Um, you will also have access to this uh, PowerPoint and uh, any additional information that you might need. My contact information is on the front and you can feel free to um, call me with any questions or concerns that you might have that we don't get to or are not answered at the end. Um, so I just want to briefly uh, talk about what fetal alcohol spectrum disorders are. I'm not going to go into great detail because uh, Dr. David Wargowski actually uh, did a webinar in this series that explains that in greater detail and he has other excellent um, podcasts on YouTube as well that you can reference. But just briefly, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder um, is an umbrella term that's used to describe the range of effects that can occur in individuals um, who were prenatally exposed to alcohol. Uh, the term fetal alcohol spectrum disorder is not a diagnosis in America. Um, the diagnoses that fall under that umbrella are fetal alcohol syndrome. Um, that is a condition where the children um, or youth tend to have a uh, full complement of facial features. They tend to look the part, and so um, their disabilities are recognized, and they tend to statistically do better than children who have an alcohol-related neurodevelopmental disorder who look fairly normal and have some relative strengths. And then uh, people question, why can you do certain things but not others? You just might not be trying and become frustrated. And those children tend to develop um, much more costly secondary disabilities, which I'll talk about later. Um, the other diagnoses on that FASD spectrum, and it is a spectrum disorder, which I'll keep stressing, um, is partial fetal alcohol syndrome and alcohol-related birth defects. Um, again, the alcohol-related neurodevelopmental disorders are the most common. Um, and we coined that a hidden disability um, because those children tend not to be diagnosed. They don't look like they have a disability. Um, they have relative strengths, and we miss this. They become frustrated um, and end up having some secondary disabilities. These are just some of the basic facial features um, for a child who would have um, fetal alcohol syndrome with a full complement of facial features. Um, there are only three of them that are um, diagnostic, which is the um, epicanthal folds, which is the distance from one corner of the eye to the other measured horizontally. Um, I'm sorry, the small pal palpebral fissures, um, the smooth filtrum, and the thin upper lip. Um, so fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, again, are a spectrum disorder. So each individual is going to be affected very differently to varying degrees, and it can range from very mild to severe. But what's common to all the fetal alcohol spectrum disorders is the damage to the brain from prenatal alcohol exposure. Um, there's a couple things that we definitely know. We know even moderate drinking during pregnancy can cause problems. Um, and again, there are multiple variables why some children are more effective than others. And again, I'll um, refer you back to Dr. Workowski's um, podcast and uh, uh, webinar in this series. 
We also know that of all the drugs of abuse, alcohol by far causes the most serious neurobehavioral damage, and that damage lasts a lifetime. There should be really no judgment um, on women who may prenatally expose their child to alcohol because among pregnant women, the highest prevalence rate of alcohol use is among women who are 35 to 44 years old who are college graduates. And many of those women are probably exposing their children to alcohol before they even know that they're pregnant. Um, we recently, um, there have been some very interesting studies that have used what's called an uh, active case ascertainment where they went into first grade classrooms um, in Midwestern cities um, in middle class school settings. And these show the prevalence rate of all fetal alcohol spectrum disorders to be 24 to 48 out of 1,000. That's higher than the rate of autism spectrum disorders, which is about 29 out of 1,000. And fetal alcohol spectrum disorders um, are more prevalent than the uh, rate of muscular dystrophy, spina bifida, and Down syndrome combined. The financial cost of caring for these children is extensive. It's over $2.5 million throughout the course of an individual's lifetime, and a cumulative cost to society for funding all the systems that they um, end up in of, of $6 billion per year. The common symptoms of all of those diagnoses under that fetal alcohol spectrum disorder umbrella are central nervous system damage, and that can be structural, neurological, or functional. And the functional kind of deficits manifest themselves like um, as cognitive deficits or developmental delays, um, executive functioning deficits, motor function delays, problems with social skills, and other physical defects. The one thing that I will always stress, and that's why I put the slide up here, is that fetal alcohol spectrum disorders are a brain injury. And through the course of my work and dealing um, with school systems and other systems with my own daughter, I found that when we discuss this as a brain injury, it number one takes away some of the stigma that's involved, and it also, I think people tend to react to it um, and accommodate it more readily. In the school systems, um, they won't classify kids for special education as this being um, a traumatic brain injury, which I kind of think they should, and I'll work on that one day, but um, as other health impairment. But it is a brain injury. Um, the other thing that's uh, unique to fetal alcohol spectrum disorders and that gets confusing for people who are dealing with these youth is that um, they tend to have uneven development um, and significant gaps between their chronological age and developmental age. And where they're highly developed in some areas, they can be significantly delayed in others. So we may have a 21-year-old who has the life or social skills of a six-year-old and the abstract reasoning of a 10-year-old, but has verbal skills of an 18-year-old. So these uh, youth sometimes tend to be kind of chatty and a little verbose, and so they can appear to know more than they really do. So these are some of the secondary disabilities. When we fail to diagnose FASD or misdiagnose it, which it frequently is, um, it results in a lack of appropriate accommodations and treatment, and that results in far more serious and costly secondary disabilities for these children. Um, and these include uh, repeated educational and vocational failure um, for youth running away from home and the resultant like residential instability, financial poverty, homelessness. Um, they have a tendency to easily be used by more sophisticated peers. Um, they suffer complex trauma and repeated victimization, including sexual victimization. Um, that leads to sexual promiscuity and sometimes early parenting and involvement with the child welfare systems. Um, they frequently have um, concurrent mental health and substance abuse issues. And again, ultimately involvement in either the child welfare, juvenile, or criminal justice systems. We do know that um, there are some factors that um, can create some protection for kids, um, some protective factors. Those include having an early diagnosis of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder by the age of six, having the diagnosis of fetal alcohol syndrome, again, the recognizable disability where most of the kids are accommodated versus having the hidden disability of alcohol-related neurodevelopmental disorder, um, that they are eligible for supplemental and support services, that they have personal safety and protection from violence, that they live in a stable nurturing home environment for over 70% of the time, especially um, during the ages of 8 to 12, that they have more than 2.8 years in each living situation, and that their basic needs are met for at least 13% of their life. 
Some of the juvenile justice statistics related to fetal alcohol spectrum disorder are as follows. So the average age in which children with an FASD start having trouble with the law is 12.8 years old. We know that 60% of people with fetal alcohol spectrum disorders have a history of trouble with the law. 50% have a history of confinement in either a jail, prison, a residential drug treatment facility, or a psychiatric hospital. 50% of adolescents and adults with FASD displayed inappropriate sexual behaviors, and 94% of individuals with an FASD also had a diagnosis of a mental illness. That's the number one secondary disability. Um, some of the symptoms that impact the juvenile justice interactions that FASD-affected youth have um, is that these symptoms manifest themselves physically, cognitively, emotionally, and behaviorally. And often, um, their behavior is interpreted as being purposeful or willful rather than um, an inability to understand cause and effect due to a brain injury. Um, sometimes they have a tendency to look as if they're not having remorse or con a conscience because they don't understand certain things and they will sometimes laugh and smile kind of in the face of serious circumstances and exhibit that kind of disconnect between what they're really feeling and how that feeling is expressed and that gets misinterpreted by people. And they also have functional deficits related to time and money management. Again, they are very easily influenced by more sophisticated peers. These kids are rarely the masterminds of a serious criminal activity and they generally commit minor crimes if they do it on their own such as seeing a bicycle um, that nobody is riding and thinking, well, that's available for me to ride um, and taking it or go stealing. Um, they tend to have poor comprehension of social rules and cues, the expectations and boundaries around social relationships. Um, and half of them are really appearing in the system only once. But they still may have difficulty separating kind of fact from fantasy. And when they're um, incarcerated, they tend to have a very high rate of victimization and exploitation. Um, these are youth who uh, can engage in real and perceived lying, so confabulation, um, as well as, like I said, stealing and more minor offenses. Um, they tend to forget the rules or directions that they're given, or they remember them too late. Um, a lot of these kids have really significant um, active working memory issues. Um, so they may actually have like a normal IQ, but have um, an active working memory, which is very, very compromised in comparison. Um, they have a tendency to not complete tasks or chores. Um, and so when that happens, they appear oppositional. When asked if they understand something, they will readily say they do when in fact they don't. And they um, have a tendency to not ask questions because they want to fit in, which they often don't. Um, they have much difficulty understanding cause and effect behavior and the concept of consequences, whether those are natural consequences or otherwise, um, because of the executive functioning um, issues. They um, tend to not be able to put into action or operationalize what they're able to verbalize. Um, and that, again, is because their verbal expressive skills often far exceed their receptive language abilities. So they appear always to understand more than they really do. Um, a lot of these kids um, have a significant inability to understand the socio-legal meaning of the judicial process. Um, and one study found that many of them had an average reading level at uh, a fifth grade level and a comprehension level of fourth grade. So all of these issues have significant implications for the juvenile justice system. In terms of learning disabilities and information processing deficits, um, these are going to significantly impact a youth's understanding of things like Miranda warnings, um, illegal search and seizure, the right to counsel. Um, their diminished capacity um, can make it very difficult for them to distinguish between right and wrong, again, to understand consequences or even form intent. Um, juvenile justice professionals, and I'm going to tell you, when I was in the um, Department of Corrections and even my time in the Office of the State Public Defender, I look back and I wonder how many of these kids I really missed. Um, many of us are um, unfamiliar, with, unfamiliar with fetal alcohol spectrum disorders despite its prevalence because there's such a stigma um, associated with it. And so sometimes we have the tendency to blur the lines between <clears throat> criminal susceptibility and criminal liability rather than recognizing the brain damage. And so do these children really, um, some of them don't have the uh, ability to have a criminal mind or um, to use that to um, engage in a criminal act. These are the kids who 
<clears throat> readily will give false confessions. So they're really vulnerable to what we call confabulation and making false confessions. Sometimes, I mean, they want to please people and <clears throat> they believe that if they confess, they'll be able to go home. And so they tend to make potentially incriminating statements about how serious their misconduct may have been. Um, these are the youth who tend to readily consent to searches of themselves or their possessions in circumstances in which, you know, um, typically uh, kids with typical uh, neurodevelopment would not. Uh, they have a tendency to be very fearful and panic during encounters with the police, which can result in them either running away <clears throat> or resisting arrest. Um, in terms of competency, um, they may be unable to understand the charges against them and, again, assisting uh, counsel in their own defense. And again, they will readily say that they understand their legal rights when asked when they really don't. Um, this will impact decisions to decline or remand or waive these children to adult court um, because they are really likely to be safer in juvenile um, justice facilities than in an adult prison due to their vulnerabilities, um, and, which is a significant issue here in Wisconsin because, um, you know, 17-year-olds in our system are considered adults. It has, a, FASD has significant um, ramifications in terms of sentencing. Sometimes attorneys may be successful in presenting FASD as a mitigating factor, um, but there have been cases that I've seen where it's been used negatively in sentencing because it's a permanent disability um, and viewed as not being amenable to treatment. Um, it certainly has an impact that we need to look at um, alternative and diversionary, diversionary sentencing options. Um, we do know that uh, court-ordered treatment is sometimes the most appropriate intervention um, for uh, sentencing responses. And just the whole concept of victimization in the juvenile justice system, I, I guess we need to really look at this and question, um, crimes committed by FASD-affected youth have two victims, um, the victim of the prenatal alcohol exposure themselves as well as the third-party victim of its consequences. Um, so because uh, juvenile justice cases are often driven by principles of general deterrence, um, these FASD-affected youth are often placed in some form of juvenile detention. And again, that's an environment that they're really ill-equipped to navigate. <clears throat> again, <clears throat> they often lack the intent to commit the crime. Um, the underlying cause of dysfunctional behavior isn't addressed because we often don't recognize that this is an FASD so they don't get the appropriate accommodations and treatment. And ergo, <clears throat> they end up not being fixed through corrections, um, either by being detained or through rehabilitative measures. So our goals in terms of the juvenile justice system are to increase FASD training among juvenile justice professionals, um, to incorporate FASD screening at all entry points into the system, universal screening because they are so significantly overrepresented in those populations to increase the number of referrals for actual diagnosis, and to begin to recognize FASD as a brain injury, which is a mitigating factor, or even where appropriate, an exculpatory factor, um, and to develop those alternative sentencing options. And by doing that, I believe that we will enhance the protection of the community, we will reduce recidivism, and we will enhance youth capacity for pro-social responsible living. So the next thing I really want to talk about is what is best practice in intervention um, and working with these youth. Um, again, first is universal screening in high-risk populations, um, always to identify and build on their strengths, which they have many, to reframe their behavior, to recognize uh, that they have retention difficulties, to employ multimodality instruction um, in a multisensory way um, that's fun, and quite frankly, that's how all brains learn the best. Um, to provide environmental accommodations, counseling and therapy, appropriate pharmacological interventions, and even to be open sometimes to thinking outside the box and some of the alternative treatments that work for individual children. And I think that one of the things that we need to realize is that a lot of these practices are very easily um, incorporated into existing systems of care. Um, they're an approach. They don't take a lot of money. They don't take tons of effort, um, they can also be beneficial to many children who um, have atypical development or other neurological um, issues. 
So in terms of screening and assessment, um, we can do that um, at the time of uh, when youth um, have contact with court. We can do it for risk assessments, and we can uh, do it for treatment planning. And all staff really need for this is basic kind of FASD 101 training, um, along with motivational interviewing. And motivational interviewing, not so much for the youth themselves because their um, brain injury and the um, damage to their executive functioning um, precludes them from really benefiting from motivational interviewing unless it's significantly modified because it's an insight-oriented approach. But for um, speaking with um, mothers and birth mothers um, and really getting an understanding of this uh, youth's background, including prenatal exposure to alcohol. So when you're deciding like who should be screened in the juvenile justice system, it should be universal in everybody. And the things that we're looking for to determine if these children should have a further assessment are low birth weight or length, small stature, uh, placement in out-of-home care, and adoption from a high-risk region, or challenges with developmental delays or learning disabilities, early childhood or special education involvement, um, problems with uh, adaptive living skills, social problems like making and keeping friends, obviously the legal involvement, um, comorbid uh, mental health and substance abuse diagnoses, medical or behavioral concerns, and of course, if we have actual confirmation of maternal alcohol use during pregnancy. Um, if they're at risk, it can be helpful to obtain a neuropsychological evaluation and to refer to a dysmorphologist or a diagnostic clinic for an assessment of FASD. Um, a dysmorphologist um, who is a geneticist who looks at uh, uh, dysmorphology and facial features is able to rule out other genetic conditions that have similar facial features and behavioral um, aspects to them. The first thing we really need to do is start building on the strength of these kids because they have a lot of strengths. And we don't tend to recognize that and really stress that enough. They're friendly, they can be very likable and caring, um, they're creative, uh, they tend to um, be extremely helpful, determined, hard workers. Sometimes they have some points of insight. Um, they have a tendency to say what's on their mind, but they're rarely malicious. Um, they tend to be sometimes good with younger children or pets. And these are kids who they believe every day is a new day. It all starts over again, which gives us the opportunity for them to learn from mistakes. Um, the other thing we need to start doing is looking at their behavior and asking why. Um, so I'm not going to go over all of these, but you can look at these later. And you know what we're looking at here is what is the behavior, what is the real cause of it, and what's the reason behind it? And so, for example, um, a, a youth who is stealing and has an FASD, it's very likely that the cause is they just they don't understand ownership and that concept because that's a little bit of an abstract concept. Um, and why do they do it? Maybe they're trying to buy friends. Um, why do they destroy property? Well, maybe they don't value objects, but maybe it's because they're angry or frustrated and they don't have other outlets. Um, so we really need to start looking at the behavior and asking why. Um, these kids have some significant retention difficulties, so we need to be sure that we're using really concrete language, that we're um, speaking in short sentences, we're only teaching one concept at a time, um, and we want to ask these kids what we've said to them. They can parrot what you just said back to them, but that doesn't mean they understand it. You want to be sure they tell you in their own words what they just heard, and we want to teach them memory strategies for daily living skills. Um, all across the board, whether it's mealtime, taking their medication, school, work, sleep. Um, in their environment, we really want to um, impart some structure and predictability. We want to monitor their level of stimulation and recognize their retention and comprehension difficulties using these multimodality instructions. And we want to repeat, repeat, repeat in terms of what we're teaching them because they may have mastered a concept one day and totally lose it the next. Um, we want to provide structure, both in terms of organized, safe physical environments across all their life domains. We want to provide very well-defined kind of areas that remain constant, keep the clutter out, um, keep the walls bare, kind of a minimalist environment, but one where they still have some stimulation and interaction with small numbers of people who are consistent presence in their lives. Um, these can serve as those points of contact for them. Um, and that's something that I think, you know, we really need to offer ahead of times to kids. Um, 
social workers. Um, I'll just talk about my personal experience. I it was always sure that my daughter had access to a social worker in school, and I wanted them to start to develop a relationship with her. She started high school um, two years ago, and the first year, um, the social worker said, I really don't understand what I'm doing with her. The second year, she said, now I understand what I'm doing with her. I was made, you know, starting with this relationship with her so that she was able to come to me when she had problems. So um, we want to alert these kids in advance of activity changes and be very consistent and immediate with consequences. And we want to impose those consequences in the environment that um, the behavior takes place in. Again, we want to monitor their level of stimulation because they can be very easily overstimulated, um, kind of redirect that behavior, anticipate those danger signs, kind of give them frequent short breaks and acknowledge um, when they're angry or overstimulated. I'm not going to read this whole thing, but I'm going to tell you um, a great thing um, for a lot of kids. Some of these, um, many of them have sensory integration issues, and um, so they have these sensitivities, and sometimes this um, ends, it results in their acting out um, physically. And so it, it, it's very worthwhile, I think, to have a sensory integration trained occupational therapist do an assessment to see if they're sensory seeking or sensory aversive and to prescribe a sensory diet. And that can really um, impact uh, youth's uh, ability to self-regulate, both physiologically and emotionally. Um, again, with these retention difficulties, boy, I, I know when I was doing probation and parole rule, or uh, aftercare plans and rules for kids, I would just give them tons of rules, and it was just too much for these kids with FASD. We really want to look at um, quality versus quantity. You know, we want to look at these, uh, how we are communicating to them, that it's not just verbal, but it's also written, and that's in a concrete language that they can understand it in an amount that they can take in. Um, sometimes these kids will do what we call masking, where they kind of gather clues by waiting for other people to go first. Um, again, so we always want to check out, do you understand? Can you put this in your own words? Because otherwise they can very frequently um, just parrot other people. Um, these are just um, various um, multimodality instruction um, techniques that we use. Often they do well with um, pictorial cues and tasks, um, having quiet study areas or quiet spaces, using sign language to supplement verbal language, or using assistive technology to assist them. And we also want to modify their time frames. So increase their time to complete objectives or for transitions and changes, and um, to just process and respond to the requirements. Again, counseling, we don't have to wait until there's a psychological behavioral issue to present themselves. We want to use um, these people as point people for um, these youth um, to start early and very often focus on improvement of their social skills, which has a lot of impl broad implications for other aspects of their life. And we want to do in vivo practice or role playing with them repeatedly in the environments in which these um, behaviors take place. Um, we need to modify the counseling environment to accommodate their disabilities, so decrease the environmental stimuli. They do much better with individual versus group counseling. Um, time of day is important because these kids can be really exhausted at the end of the day from kind of holding it all together. And again, they don't do well with insight-oriented counseling. We want to keep it really concrete um, and use practical language. Um, that's very specific to them with very ex uh, specific examples that are recognizable to them. Again, we don't want to expect them to generalize from uh, one environment to the next, so we want to teach in real environments. Um, and so it can require like a lot of field trips to their home, their work, their community. Um, so many of the juvenile justice initiatives are great, um, such as cognitive behavioral therapy, 12-step programming, or motivational interviewing. But again, these are all therapies that require a lot of insight um, into your behavior, and because of the brain damage um, and the um, compromised executive functioning, these need to either be significantly modified or not used with um, children with FASD because they just don't have that insight-oriented ability um, through their executive functioning to really benefit. Um, we also use pharmacological intervention. Um, so the use of stimulants is not really a treatment for FASD itself, but it can address that overactivity and inattention, the impulsivity, and some of the secondary concerns. Um, antidepressants, uh, generally uh, um, uh, SSRI, um, will address depressive symptoms, um, sleep problems. Sometimes um, kids are prescribed like clonidine for sleep as well, and other people use a tiered melatonin where they get um, a small dose, uh, like around 5 o'clock at night, and then a larger dose when they go to bed, one dose uh, 
initiating sleep and one dose sustaining sleep. And those antidepressants can deal with those secondary effects like negativity, irritability, aggression, kind of antisocial behaviors. Um, sometimes we use neuroleptics or antipsychotic medication um, to address any psychotic symptoms, but those are generally not associated with the FASD, but they can address aggression, anxiety, or behavior regu regulation. Um, and sometimes anti-anxiety medications. Um, that can, anxiety can sometimes be that basis for underlying cause in some psychiatric conditions. I think we always, with these kids, want to be really careful that we're trying one thing at a time and, you know, slowly um, modulating its uh, dose um, before we, like, load them up with many um, different medications, which I've seen all too frequently with kids. And we're finding that there's really some benefit to some alternative interventions that maybe don't have the evidence base behind them, but I'm going to tell you, if you find two or three things that happen to work for these kids, it can make a huge difference in their life. And as a professional or somebody working with them or raising them, it can make a huge difference <clears throat> in your life as well. Um, so some of these are like uh, biofeedback, um, relaxation therapy, meditation or modified kind of mindfulness, acupuncture, um, nutritional supplementation or vitamin supplementation and nutritional um, sorts of uh, efforts as well. And um, Dan Dabowski is just a fabulous um, advocate and uh, trainer in FASD, just a, a real expert. And um, what he has said, I think, really sums up what this is all about, that we have to move from viewing these individuals as failing if they don't do well in a particular program to view the program as not providing what the individual needs in order to succeed. And these are some references, and now I think we'll take questions. Okay, so question one is, um, will it be possible to download the slides for reference? Yes, it definitely will. Um, so um, I spoke with somebody here, and they're going to just, you know, create um, a PDF, and they can get it to you, and um, definitely you are able to uh, have these slides for reference. Okay, if there are no other questions, I just want to thank everybody um, for coming and for your interest in this, and for taking this information and spreading it, the word. So thank you, and uh, have a great day, everybody.